Good evening, everyone. This is Chairwoman Jane Lichter. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, March 14, 2023. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Ms. Roa Hassan. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held in person and virtually and broadcast through the BCPS online live meeting broadcast on BCPS TV, Comcast Channel 73, and Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the March 14th agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? There are none. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Consult with counsel to obtain legal advice, and consult with staff, consultants, or other individuals about pending or potential litigation. The summary of the closed session and open session information summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that I call on Mr. McCall. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I'd like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves, certificated appointments, and deceased recognition of service. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D1 through D5? So moved, Harvey. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second, Pumphrey. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Mr. Offerman? Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is a Thank you, Mr. McCall. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that I call on Dr. Williams. Madam Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, and members of the board, I am bringing forward the following administrative appointment for your approval, Enterprise System Engineer, Office of Network Support Services. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit E1? Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments? So moved, Hassan. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second, Dominowski. Second, Savoy. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Uh, Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Dr. Williams? So our only appointment this evening is Christopher Costin uh, as the Enterprise System Engineer in the Office of Network Support Services. Um, 
Prior to this appointment, he was a network analyst in the Office of Network Support Services. He was also a contractual analyst, and he has prior experience in the Apple Store for over two years. He brings over one year of experience in Baltimore County. Congratulations, Christopher Costin. He is watching virtually. Congratulations. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your comments to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. Online registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Speakers are selected randomly using electronic selection process from all registrations received within the designated time frame. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. No speaker substitutions will be allowed. For those who were not selected through the online registration, a wait list sign-up sheet was available 30 minutes prior to the meeting. If a registered speaker is absent, speaker, slot, speaker slots will be reassigned from the wait list so that the 10 speaker slots are allocated. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. Persons using language that is threatening or promotes violence against a BCPS employee are subject to legal penalties. Persons who otherwise disrupt or disturb this meeting will not be allowed to continue their remarks and will be escorted from the meeting. I ask speakers to observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the tone or see that time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under Board of Education, participation by the public. I now call on our advisory and stakeholder group leaders to speak. Our first speaker is Mr. Billy Burke from CASE. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Mrs. Lichter, Vice Chair Mrs. Harvey, Superintendent Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of CASE. I'd like to speak to you tonight about two issues. The first issue is the STAR ratings. It is important that we as educators are accountable for student learning, but I am concerned that the STAR system of ranking schools creates a confusing and misleading picture of what is happening in schools. Rating systems like STAR assume everyone comes to the table with the same resources and opportunities. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Variability is the norm. Students are different and the challenges they face happen at the community, school, and family level. It is important to remember that STAR ratings are a snapshot in time. The rankings don't explain where schools started and how schools and students have grown. And most importantly, the STAR ratings don't provide a corrective action plan for moving forward based on the individual or real challenges that students, schools, and communities face. I'm not against accountability, but rating systems like STAR mislead the public into believing that one school is good and one school is bad based on ratings. As you visit schools, you will see excellence in schools with a one-star rating, and you will see room for improvement in schools with a five-star rating. The second issue I'd like to bring to your attention is changes to COMAR when disciplining students with IEPs that have exhibited dangerous behavior like weapons possession and fighting. The law limits and prohibits the suspension and expulsion of students that exhibit dangerous behaviors if those behaviors are a manifestation of the student's disabilities. 
the law limits the use of virtual learning for these students. What the law doesn't do, though, is provide direction and support, as well as resources to schools and school districts in providing appropriate placements and supports for these students. Teachers and administrators feel unheard and under-resourced when asking for support in providing an appropriate education for these students. The current law makes students feel and staff feel unsafe. I often hear board members say to staff, how can we help? This is how you can help. Lobby at the state and national levels for the resources and guidance needed to provide appropriate education supports to students struggling with behavioral challenges. Ask for processes that are rigorous and funded, but streamlined to get students the supports they need quickly. It would be an important step in making schools safer, and you can be part of that. Just ask your child's teacher. Just ask your children. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cindy Sexton from TAPCO. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Now that your budget for FY24 has passed, we continue our negotiations and advocacy with the county exec and the county council for funding. And we also continue our negotiations with the school system around our compensation. My message remains recruiting and retaining our educators. And while I understand the why we are cutting positions to match enrollment data, I do not agree that is what is best for our students. Large class sizes, discipline concerns, mental, physical, emotional, academic needs, and more. Our, st our students need more educators, not fewer. And our special ed students are losing their educators due to resignations and retirements at one of the highest rates. None of our students can afford fewer educators. We need every single person to help us meet their needs. The recent MCAP report supports this need. In his community update, Dr. Williams addresses the need to improve and accelerate student learning, and that will be very difficult with fewer educators. The immediate and long-term strategic steps outlined are important to the work, but as I look through them, I again see the need for educators, the people in the schoolhouse with the students addressing their needs. Can we please work together and find a way to be sure that the compensation is there so we can keep edu the educators we have and attract new ones? In a perfect world, we would hire more and keep our class sizes smaller, but since that is unlikely, let's do all we can now for our students. When the work on these strategic steps is taking place, please be sure educators have a seat at the table from the beginning so we are all on the same page, rowing in the same direction towards success for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Next is general public comment, and our first speaker is Bash Faron. Mr. Faron? Dr. Faron? Yes, you're first. Thank you. Good, good evening. evening. Last board meeting was a good testament for all of you, especially you, the chair, for finishing early, 9.30. I think you have the skill. However, in the meeting, there were lots of unhappy teachers, public speakers. Six of them were TAPCO members, unhappy. The other four are parents who are not really happy, and one of the four is a teacher. It is really interesting that no one had something positive in the last board meeting uh, about the school system. And out of the educational advisory councils, only the central area chair came in, and that's her second time, I believe, in about eight or nine months. No one else. So my thought to you is, and honestly, I don't mean disrespect. 
I have been here for 25 years. What TAPCO and CASE told you today and what the teachers and parents told you last board meeting is the same I heard when I was here with Dr. Berger, with Dr. Hirston, then Dr. Dance, then Dr. White, and now Dr. Williams. We've certainly made progress, but the only thing I really can see as a bird flying high and looking down, not on the minute details, that the school system today in relation to 20 years ago has laptops and has the virtual learning program, which is still an incubation uh, stage, despite the good work of Dr. Mary McComas. The rest of it is more or less the same. And I, I really just want you to think about that. If the McCormick Company in Baltimore County functions like the school system, we'll have no spices. We would not. No company would. You are not independent. You have no control on the budget. And you have so many bosses, both in Towson and in Annapolis. And I really think that needs to be addressed. Only you, the board member, can lobby the state and the county for being truly independent. Truly independent. You have one product, and that's students. No other products. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Amy Adams. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. I look forward to the presentation this evening and the discussion of the 2022 MCAP results. More and more parents and community members are accepting the fact, based on multiple data points, that our schools are not adequately educating the majority of children, especially the most vulnerable in our communities. Tutoring and other interventions previously discussed won't do much at this point, especially if they're limited on the number of students involved, are optional, or are outside of school hours. One of the problems related to subgroups of students specifically identifying race and income is that many white and black parents from upper income levels did not realize that their children were being cheated and not educated to their fulfill, full ability. Instead, they settled for often questionable indicators of success based on Baltimore County school report cards and grades. They accepted information from the school district and didn't ask the vital question about the quality of education their children were actually receiving. Many parents are just satisfied to know that their children were doing better than others, and that's how they judge success. The problem is now in the fabric of the school system. BCPS used to create nationally recognized in-house curriculum based on state and federal standards to meet the needs of their student population. Now, starting in the last decade, we've become more dependent on spending millions of dollars on curriculum programs, subscriptions, and materials that yield little academic results, and certainly are not solutions for the problems facing our students and teachers today. The problems in our schools did not start with poor children and teachers. It began with how they were deprived of the education and the support they deserve from the system. Now we are plagued by this issue because it has become more and more evident in our communities and in schools with increased levels of violence and blight. Recently, Mary and I have become members of the Randallstown NAACP in hopes to collaborate our efforts when advocating for Baltimore County students. As you move forward, citizens are depending on you to make right decisions regarding our school system leadership before it's too late. We need people in leadership who know how to run an education system and get improved measurable results. We need leaders who have knowledge of the past and concrete vision for the future. We need leaders who will be evaluated based on their actions, not just their well-meaning words. We need leaders who are openly communicate and be responsible to the public. Finally, you must select a superintendent ready to confront the current state of academics and work to overcome the mountain of challenges. There are solutions that don't cost millions, but we need leaders who aren't distracted by the bling and chasing technology, but rather who, those who believe in the ability of all children. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Julie Coletta. Good 
Good evening. Good evening. My name is Julie Collada, and I am a parent of three students at Hampton Elementary, and I serve as Hampton's PTA president. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you once again about the serious overcrowding that we are facing at Hampton. This is a serious problem, and the parents and teachers of Hampton Elementary implore you to find a creative solution to provide relief for our school. Trailers are not an adequate solution for the 812 students at Hampton. Dr. Williams, the parents, teachers, and students of Hampton Elementary implore you to enact an emergency redistricting for Hampton Elementary. Redistricting is a free, reasonable, and appropriate solution to the overcrowding we are facing. We do not have time to wait for a new superintendent. We want an emergency redistricting for Hampton Elementary to be added to your March 28th agenda and brought to a vote. While we have all grown tired of the constant redistricting across Baltimore County, this is the only long-term solution that will ease the strain on Hampton's catchment area and relieve the stress on our students, teachers, and parents. We need this situation to be rectified before August. We didn't ask for this problem. We spoke out in 2020 and tried to warn the board that the Pleasant Plains Boundary Study would only shift the problem and not provide a solution to overcrowding in the Central District. An emergency redistricting is a reasonable, appropriate, and free solution. According to the September 30th enrollment numbers, four neighboring schools are under capacity and could jointly provide relief to Hampton. As I shared last week, one school in particular is at 79% of capacity with 100 seats available. We need you to look at the numbers closely and provide a creative solution that evenly distributes students to all four neighboring and under-enrolled schools so as to not overcrowd any one school again. Cromwell Valley, Valley Elementary could be a part of the solution. Baltimore County can no longer support an elementary school, mag, uh, elementary magnet school for the whole county in, in the Central District. We need Cromwell to be a neighborhood school that supports more than 150 students in its walkable catchment area. But Cromwell should only be a part of the solution. You can add all the trailers you want, but Cap Hampton's cafeteria and gymnasium were built for 300 and do not support our population of 812. Hampton is not a candidate for a future capital project that would solve this problem. This is not a matter of whether or not you decide to redraw the boundary lines for Hampton. It's a matter of when. Hampton's boundary is way too large and it needs to be reevaluated. In addition to adding trailers, we were also notified that the current plan includes moving pre-K-3 to Jacksonville Elementary. When everything in the state of Maryland is moving towards the importance of early childhood education, Baltimore County should be searching for pre-K classrooms, not eliminating them. When a solution exists to allow Hampton to maintain our pre-K program, why aren't we examining that solution? Please take time to look at Hampton's neighboring Thank you. Our next speaker is Laura Hilaris. And you'll tell me the correct pronunciation when you come up. Hilaris. Hilaris, okay. Hilaris. Hilaris. No okay. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. Some of you may remember me from the Pleasant Plains Boundary Study discussion of three years ago. My name is Laura Holieris, and I'm the parent of a Hampton Elementary kindergartner. I'm back because, as I feared, the situation at Hampton has become a huge problem. Too many students in each classroom, teachers stretched to the max, children's behavior and hence learning suffering. I understand that part of the defense of voting in favor of moving kids to Hampton in 2020 was that Hampton would, quote, share the burden of overcrowding alongside Pleasant Plains. However, we can now see the, that the entire issue or burden was shifted to Hampton. In 2020, Pleasant Plains enrollment was 124% and Hampton's was around 90%. According to BCPS enrollment numbers from this past September, Pleasant Plains is now at 96% capacity and Hampton's is now at 121%. So not only did Hampton meet the capacity, it well surpassed it in only three years. This was not an optimal use of time allocated to that boundary study as it did not provide an effective outcome, only transferred the problem. If Hampton Elementary continues on the current trend, its enrollment will be close to 900 students next year, an unacceptable and un unheard of number for BCPS Elementary School. With the sheer volume of current students, much less any additional, it is not an effective learning environment. My incredible Ridgely Middle eighth grade English teacher, Mrs. Jones, hammered into my memory the idea of foreshadowing in literature. There are so many points in a book, she said, where you can see a foreboding or prediction of what is to come. 
Foreshadowing gives clues as to a climax, a turning point, or even the story's ending. I strongly believe this is true in life as well. I and other parents saw the train coming in 2020 and look at the devastating results for Hampton. But you can take action now before there's a complete and total overcapacity catastrophe. We desperately need an urgent short-term solution and as we've been saying for months, trailers are not good enough, especially since the gym and cafeteria support only one third of our enrollment. Kindergartners cut out of what should be school-wide assemblies, multiple PE classes at a time sharing an already too small gymnasium, and second graders starting their lunch at almost one o'clock are very sad byproducts of these facts. While Hampton teachers and staff are doing their best to adjust and accommodate, these procedures should not be normalized. We are here requesting an agenda item be added to the Board of Education's next meeting agenda. The subject, an immediate Hampton Elementary School boundary study. Hampton cannot shoulder the overcrowding burden by itself, and this means students must be moved to neighboring undercapacity schools, of which there are at least four. We need to do this to keep parents from unenrolling kids to, and sending them to private schools, to keep our teachers motivated and to, to work at Hampton, and to keep our students achieving at their highest potential. I beseech you to take action, recognize the foreshadowing, and do something to affect the outcome. Thank you. Our next speaker um, virtually is Darren Bedillo. He's not, he's not on? Okay. Our next speaker is Stephanie Benetti. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, uh, Madam Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. My name is Stephanie Benetti, and I'm here tonight on, as a concerned parent on behalf of other parents, students, and educators of Hampton Elementary School. First, I would like to thank you all for allowing me to speak this evening. I know you have um, a lot of things that you hear on a variety of issues, um, and so I really appreciate your time. Um, I currently have a kindergartner in Hampton, a three-year-old who's excited to one day attend, and another child on the way. Uh, as a lifetime Baltimore County resident, I'm committed to ensuring that my children thrive in public schools for many years to come. Although I'm new to BCPS and have heard nothing but glowing reviews of Hampton from friends and neighbors, as a volunteer and a class mom, it's obvious that things are not as they should be. Teachers and school staff are frustrated and overwhelmed. Parents and administrators are fearful of continued overcrowding and usage that far exceeds the capacity of the infrastructure. The issue is that Hampton is trying to accommodate more children than the building was ever intended to serve. The current enrollment exceeds 800 students in a building designed for 670. The cafeteria and gym can only hold 300 at a time, making school-wide assemblies impossible. Not only has this over-enrollment created a cramped and at times chaotic environment, but it has also had the unintended consequence of suspending the threes preschool program at Hampton. So space could be turned over to hold more elementary school classrooms at a time of the blueprint for Maryland's future, when we should be embracing early childhood education, we are having to close our own program. And I believe that this is simply unacceptable. I'm here to echo the comments of Julie and Laura and to also offer a solution. I am here to implore the board to consider an immediate emergency redistricting. Um, using the September numbers indicate that there are four neighboring schools, one of which is a magnet school with a very small walkable catchment. And all of these neighboring schools have available seats. An emergency redistricting would be a free, appropriate action to ensure that our kids start school in the fall with more reasonable class sizes. Because the overcrowding issue must be addressed with the urgency our kids deserve, I would like to respectfully, respectfully request that this be on your next meeting agenda. It's not a future problem, it's a today problem. I thank you for your time, and I hope that the board will take this, the appropriate actions to work toward a resolution regarding this very serious but very solvable dilemma. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Bedillo. Hello, yes, can you hear me? Yes. All right, thank you very much. Um, you know, I wanted to, to get on this call. Um, you know, I'm there every week um, representing the, my county and part of the Baltimore County Parent and Student Coalition. Um, and like I said last week, I got numerous calls about violence in the schools uh, parents frustrated, not knowing what to do. Uh, parents thinking about homeschooling and just quitting their jobs and having one income. 
because they just can't take their violence, the learning environment. You know, my question to the board is, when has being equitable been more important than education? I just don't understand it. We would much rather our kids know their pronouns than learn how to read or write. I honestly believe that we need to focus on the safety and the learning environment, but also we're not doing nothing to catch these kids up. We have a couple months left of school. What is the board, what are the teachers doing? What is the, uh, what, what is the leadership doing to catch these kids up? Or are we just gonna continue to pass failing students on to the next grade? I think all the board members need to look at themselves in the mirror and figure out what they can do before school ends to help these children catch up because they're so far behind. We're counting on you, and I'm hoping somebody steps up. Up until now, I haven't seen none. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lloyd Allen. Good evening and happy Pi Day, Chair, Lecter, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. Thank you for your time. I'm Lloyd Allen, he, him, special educator in mathematics, speaking as an individual to express gratitude for last meeting's results. Speaking of Pi Day, there are three problems in classical Greek mathematics that are impossible to solve. Squaring the circle, doubling the cube, and trisecting an arbitrary angle are tasks that can't be performed with a compass and an unmarked straight edge. Similarly, it is impossible to create a budget that satisfies all stakeholders. BCPS announced through Facebook that association negotiations are ongoing to achieve increased compensation for all employees and address salary scales and blueprint requirements in the board's requested budget. I'm reading that to mean that the budget allows for the compressed salary scale that was mutually agreed last year to be within the bounds of this budget that just got passed. I appreciate the school board members and other BCPS staff who have been present at the County Council Town Hall and budget hearings over the last month and a half. Our presence at these hearings increases the chance that any mutually agreed salary scale and each other part of the budget will be funded. Mr. Olszewski stated at the District 6 Town Hall that his goal is, by the time that his term is over, for Baltimore County teachers to be the best paid in the state. I think that's a great goal. All of this will increase the probability of retaining and recruiting educators, which will increase the probability of positive outcomes for the students of Baltimore County, as long as we don't cut staffing ratios, particularly at what is perceived to be at a greater degree than the actual decreases in enrollment. These students largely become the adults who drive the potential of Baltimore County as a whole. One more piece of gratitude. Uh, last year, I advocated for something that may well have already been in the works, uh, for ASL to be actualized as a vehicle for meeting the World Language College Completer graduation requirement. On June 30th of last summer, BCPS officially announced that CCBC ASL 101 and 102 were recognized options for meeting that requirement. I hope that students are able to make use of this option and that this is mutually beneficial for BCPS, CCBC, and these students. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Danielle Smith. Good evening. Good evening. I first would like to thank you for this opportunity to speak tonight. You are all doing a thankless job, and I want to let you know that we see you. I am here as an advocate, speaking on behalf of individuals who, while you won't see them here speaking or attending your, your meetings personally, they are extremely concerned about the welfare of their children and grandchildren. However, they have to work two and three jobs and can't afford daycare, let alone the luxury to sit here for hours to convey their issues and concern. That's my job. We encourage BCPS to continue to expand and provide resources for early childhood education services because we all know that it is truly the foundation of our future leaders and productive citizens. When a child is exposed to early childhood education via pre-K and kindergarten programs, their chances of being successful grows exponentially. The opportunity for every child to receive equitable education Educational services will also address many of the aptitude disparities that we see throughout our country, state, and county, putting children 
future taxpayers and future voters across our community at an advantage. It will enable all children to access an even playing field for future opportunities throughout their lives. The foundation is imperative. While there are specific programs for ECE, for those living under the poverty level, individuals that fall right over the cusp in the living wage category can only afford basic needs and quality early childhood education isn't typically one of them. It is the hope that these individuals be considered to receive benefits, especially since they are paying exorbitant fees for subpar daycare services that are in some cases more expensive than their mortgages, as well as before and after cares. Some have st stated that they have, to, have chosen the option of quitting their jobs, a more challenging issue for single parents. Getting an early childhood education is truly the key to equity and edu educational success. One important case study to consider is private daycares. They are community staples. They are com community staples and educated over three gener educators over three generations. Their work is the epitome, the epitome of the vitality of early childhood education. Not only are our children reading and writing at three and four, but they are socially apt, talented, and respectful. The early childhood educators not only educate, they give unconditional love and support to the kids and their families, and the results are real. At a large percent, and a large percentage of their graduates have gone on to attend college, and, and many are Ivy League gra graduates. They are also successful, and many alumni. Their kids, they also bring their kids and their grandkids back to these same day kids, daycares. We need to make sure that private institutions are equipped with all of the necessary tools that they need to continue shaping our future leaders. I am formally requesting that private daycare centers be considered for inclusion and the county. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Our next speaker is Sharon Seroff. Good evening. Good evening. I'm here to talk tonight about a service called Home and Hospital that has been a big concern, especially this year. Uh, the service of Home and Hospital has traditionally been a temporary service to students who cannot attend normal school hours due to medical, mental health, or pregnancy conditions. Students receive their services one-on-one -on -one from a tutor to address their instruction. They get six to 10 hours of instruction a week, depending upon their grade and amount of classes. There are students, believe it or not, who cannot attend school on a full-time basis within the hours that they are expected to attend. And I have several on my caseload. This has worsened over the past three years because of the pandemic, bringing to light immunocompromised students who, again, cannot, cannot attend school on a full-time basis. They can't attend in the building at all. They need to receive their services virtually. And a lot of these kids have IEPs and have a situation where the VLP just does not meet their needs. Um, what I have found, unfortunately, is that students on home and hospital are not getting the same curriculum as their peers. There's something radically wrong with that. If they are on it temporarily, how are they supposed to re-enter the building and catch up if they don't have the same curriculum. If they are on it full time, how are they supposed to really gain a quality education getting standards that everybody else gets? We have a crisis in the state of Maryland and particularly in Baltimore County looking at the quality of the curriculum and the quality of the scores that just came out from the NCAP, 
these students need to have the same curriculum, if not better, than their peers, and not given a watered down curriculum and forced out the door or forced to be promoted without getting what their peers get. Thank you. Thank you. And our last speaker is Ramana Basillo. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Madam Chair Lecter, Vice Chair Harvey, Dr. Williams, and members of the board, I am excited and I'm pleased to be here tonight. I make a practice of doing my thank yous first and my gratitudes first. So I want to take a moment to thank all of you who attended the Deer Park Middle Magnet public meeting um, to hear our concerns about our overcapacity issues. Um, we had our speaker speak on behalf of several of us um, who outlined very well the good, the bad, and the ugly related to the boundary study. Um, but principally, she had an, opp an opportunity to let you all know how much we appreciate the work of the committee. I sit before you as a person who participated in the boundary study, a boundary study that was necessary and important to help us address some critical issues. At the time, we were almost 300 students over capacity. We had students sitting in the hallway eating lunch. We added another period of lunch where students were eating roughly 1, 1 15 during the day. Students were doing homework on the floor. We had every nook and cranny available. Our capacity was so great that students would huddle against the wall to walk from class to class. You all heard that, particularly Dr. Williams and his staff and members of the boundary study. We spent time working through the issues, those issues that also mean that other schools in the Northwest area, particularly the middle schools, will share the burden that we felt at the beginning of the year, the beginning of the pandemic. I want to put a footnote and maybe even elevate the footnote to say we successfully had conversations, we had community input, the boundary study, and hats off to Dr. Paul Taylor and Mr. Dixit and the group who actually made sure I didn't miss a beat even when I was out on surgery, making sure that everyone had an opportunity for input. I thank you, Dr. Williams, for hearing us, for asking us to stay the course. A friend, colleague, and supporter of mine who couldn't be here today asked this time 10 days, it would be 10 days on March the 5th, if we could come to this group, talk about the boundary study, the overcrowdedness, the impact of it. Dr. Williams and this board heard us. She would be here today were it not for the fact that she went home to God on March the 5th. So I sit here on behalf of Ms. Martinez to say thank you for hearing us, to say thank you for looking to the future and for making sure that the future won't. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report. And for that, I call on Dr. Williams. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, and members of the board. I'm pleased to present my superintendent's report to the board and team BCPS. Again, this report includes celebrations, updates, evidence of our strategic plan, the compass, our pathway to excellence in action. Our effort to heal, rebuild, and recover are ongoing. As we move forward together, we continue to focus on the academic achievement of our students and partnerships in our schools. We know that we can't do this work alone, and we thank you for your support of our school system. BCPS celebrates Women's History Month in March. Uh, during this month, we honor and celebrate women's contribution to culture, history, and society. As it was mentioned earlier, Pi Day 
is celebrated today, March 14th, around the world. Um, pi is the symbol, the Greek letter is a symbol used in mathematics to represent a constant, the ratio of the circumference of a circle to its diameter, which is approximately 3.14159. Pi Day is an annual opportunity for math enthusiasts to recite the infinite digits of pi, talk to their friends about math, and of course, eat pi. Please join us in celebrating the invaluable contributions of our Team BCPS school social workers. National Social Worker Work Week was March 5th through March 11th. Our social school social workers provide counseling and helps to help students, parents, and school staff to address the psychological and social well-being of our students from elementary to university age. Our school Social workers also work with outside support services and agencies to assist these students who need help in their personal lives. The Community College of Baltimore County, in collaboration with BCPS, is hosting College Fair 2023 on March 14th and 15th. At the event, students and their parents can meet representatives from more than 100 colleges and universities, historically black colleges and universities, and military and trade schools. Congratulations to the 169 outstanding educators nominated this year for the Teacher of the Year. BCPS hopes to elevate the teaching profession, recognize excellence in teaching, and thank all teachers for their skill knowledge, creativity, and dedication. For a photo gallery of the nominees, take a look at bcps.org. Congratulations to three music educators in BCPS honored by the state, Laura Allison of Ridge Ruxton and Grace White of Colgate Elementary are among seven individuals named the MME a, or the Maryland Music Educators Association Outstanding Music Educator, Educators of the Year. Jim Wharton from Cadenceville High School is one of two retired educators inducted into the MMEA Hall of Fame. Congratulations to Justin Patterson, media production teacher from Chesapeake High School. He has been named Magnet Schools America Region 1 Teacher of the Year. As one of the six regional winners, Mr. Patterson will be recognized at the MSA National Conference to be held in April. And he is a candidate for the MSA National Teacher of the Year Award. It's Arts in Our Schools Month. This weekend, the Baltimore Museum of Art showcased the outstanding artwork created by Team BCPS students. Congratulations to our amazing students and special thanks to our staff and families for your support. The 2023 All-County Band, Orchestra, and Chorus Concerts took place on March 11th. The concerts featured approximately 600 BCPS middle and high school students. Congratulations to our amazing musicians for a job well done. Congratulations to our winter sports, excuse me. Congratulations to all of our student athletes who participated in winter sports and our winter county champions in basketball. We had Newtown boys basketball as well as Pikesville girls basketball cheerleading. 3A, 4A, we had Perry Hall High School. And 1A, 2A, we had Sparrows Point High School. Indoor track, we had Towson High School boys and Hereford High School girls. And wrestling, we had Sparrows Point High School. The Winter Regional Champions, basketball girls, we had Pikesville High School, Hereford High School, Eastern Tech, and Towson High School. Our boys, Lock Raven High School, Newtown High School, Overly High School, and Parkville High School. Cheerleading, we had Hereford High School, Spar Sparrows Point High School, Pikesville High School, and indoor track, we had Western Tech Girls,
Hereford High School girls, and Hereford High School boys. Congratulations to our Winter Sports State Championship student athletes, coaches, school communities, and families. For basketball, 2A, we had Newtown High School boys, 1A, Pikesville High School girls, 4A, Parkville High School boys. Indoor track, we had Tammy Arruyo, Overly High School, Newtown High School 2A boys, Nakaya Williams, Woodlawn High School, Dacine Shell, Milford Mill Academy, Miles Taylor, Franklin High School, Tyler Daly, Delaney High School. In wrestling, we had Ugachi Onunobi, Randallstown High School, Owen Bell from Hereford High School, and Amandre Wooden, Owings Mills High School. And for our ally, Bachi, we had Delaney High School, Franklin High School, and Lock Raven High School. The best and the brightest made their way to the Timonium Fairgrounds recently for the BCPS Job Fair. Teachers, principals, and support staff showcased their achievements, hoping to attract the next stellar employee. Many thanks to the Human Resources team for organizing such a successful event and to all of our school leaders and supporting offices and teams who were on hand to share the best of BCPS with potential candidates. I'm pleased to invite you to attend our first ever Champions for Children Educator Recognition event to celebrate excellence in education. So on April 19th, this fun and festive evening will include a pre-award show reception for the honorees, sponsor, and guests, awards presentations punctuated by student performance, performances, and a post-production dessert reception. Each honoree will be recognized for exemplary work in pursuit of the BCPS core purpose. The evening will culminate in the announcement of the BCPS Teacher of the Year, who represents BCPS in the Maryland Teacher of the Year competition. As a reminder, the State of the School will take place on March 22nd at Dundalk Sollers Point High School. As you know, last week, the Maryland State Department of Education released new accountability information for each public school system in the state, including the star ratings for the individual schools. These new star ratings are calculated using the 2021 to 2022 school year accountability data. Since 2017 and 2018, the Maryland State Department of Education, or MSDE, evaluates school systems and individual schools on a set of criteria. So at the elementary and middle school level, schools are assessed on academic achievement, academic progress, gr progress in achieving English language proficiency and school quality and student success. High schools are assessed on academic achievement, graduation rate, progress in achieving English language proficiency, readiness for post-secondary success, and school quality and student success. This slide uh, provides a comparison for Baltimore County Public Schools average star rating for years 2018, 2019, and 2022 compared to the state. The overall BCPS 2022 star average is 3.2, which is 0.2 less, or two-tenths points less than our 2019 star average of 3.4 and below the state. We know, we know there is much more work to be done to ensure each student at every school is meeting their full potential. And there are great things happening in our school system. As central office team members and I continue to visit schools, we have seen high levels of student engagement, rigorous teaching and learning, growth in our students and staff, and deep community and partnership building. BCPS is working relentlessly to improve and accelerate student learning. That concludes my report, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Next on the agenda is the chair's report. And I would like to just echo Dr. Williams' um, comments about this weekend. We saw children's passions all over the place. We saw them at Carver Center with our all-county um, 
chorus, band, and orchestra um, performing. We saw it at the Bummer Museum of Art with our kids' display, and we saw it on many courts and many fields. Um, so it's just wonderful to see our students excel. Um, and also thank you to the staff in the performing arts, the visual arts, and also athletics for the amount of work that they put into all the different events that took place over the weekend. Um, I also um, want to thank our th three um, area educational advisory councils, um, Dr. Stitt of the Northwest, um, Ms. Purcell of the Southwest, and Ms. Stith from the Northeast. Last night they had a joint um, meeting where over 70 people at one point were on that meeting. Um, it was virtual, we had a lot of staff um, presenting, but it was a wonderful joint effort and well attended by our um, community. So thank you to those three women for their work um, in putting together that joint um, presentation. Last um, month I shared that um, I would share updates about our superintendent search. Um, so that's what I'm going to do now. I just have several um, updates to share. Um, next slide, please. Um, the board officially launched the search for a new superintendent for Baltimore County on March 1st with the hiring of the executive firm um, McPherson and Jacobson. Um, we're committed to a transparent and efficient search process and engaging with um, Team BCPS stakeholders. We met with the firm already to develop a work plan for the search, including the nature and the extent of the um, community involvement and engagement. Um, they will assist us in key pieces of the national search process, including identifying the desired qualifications and characteristics, um, facilitating the process for community input and engagement, identifying and fielding a pool of highly qualified candidates, coordinating the interview process and helping the board narrow down a field of candidates and advising the board on an appropriate compensation package. The search firm will also gather feedback a number of ways. One is through a survey that will be available in multiple languages. The survey will be emailed to all BCPS families and staff and will be accessible online and that will occur very um, soon. Next week, March 21st through the 23rd, the search firm will hold six community input meetings. On the 21st, there will be meetings held at Carver Center and also the Western School of Technology. On the 22nd, meetings will be held at Newtown or Perry Hall. And on the 23rd, at Chesapeake High School and Hereford Middle School. The purpose of these meetings will be to allow, um, go back one slide please. The purpose of the meetings will be to allow the community to provide the firm with their input concerning the characteristics um, of what they feel are essential for the next superintendent. The public is welcome to attend any of the community meetings. Um, and again, if you cannot attend a meeting, the survey will also prompt the same types of questions and information. Next slide, please. Um, I'm also pleased to share that there has been a superintendent search website that has been put together by our communications office. It is up and it will serve as a hub for the information related to the search and will include important dates and milestones. And then on the last slide um, is the tentative timeline for the search process um, as we worked on with the firm um, beginning now um, and through May. So um, we will also share updates on the search process on the website. We encourage members of the BCPS community to participate in the meetings or complete the survey or both um, and share your thoughts with the board throughout the process. And I will continue to provide updates um, during my chair's report each month. Next on the agenda is our student board members report. And for that, I call on Ms. Hassan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone. So it is, as always, a pleasure to be here with you all today, serving our students and their respective community. It remains to be an honor to serve our students and represent their unwavering voices. Within the past month, I visited 13 schools, including Parkville Middle, Parkville High School, Pine Grove Middle, Rosedale and Crossroads Alternative Centers, Kenwood, Eastern Tech, Stemmers Run, Dundalk Middle, Sollers Point, Dundalk High, Woodlawn High, Woodlawn Middle, and Watershed Public Charter School. In meeting with each of these schools and their amazing students, I must once again reiterate to you their unique set of needs. As we make decisions that are essential to the function of our schools and our system, I ask that you most importantly hear our students. I ask that you remember us as a student from Woodlawn Middle School asked me to do as we discussed their love for their community and their schools. In our system, perception and mis misconceptions must not significantly influence our decision, if any at all. 
It is misconception that divides our system. It is the lack of empathy and lack of active efforts that harm our students. Our students are nothing short of excellent and have the potential to grow intellectually and emotionally so long as we provide them the resources to do so. I thank you once again for beginning this process was with me as we approved resolution 2023-01 mental health last meeting. Our next steps must acknowledge each and every single one of our communities. As I visited alternative schools, Rosedale and Crossroads, I learned that our students' needs are unique and action to support them must be flexible in order to individualize. Our alternative schools shared the idea that stigma is largely what may prevent our students from moving forward and growing. Those schools are not permanent for our students, though many students have shared that they wish they could stay and learn with no distractions and with the mental health supports that they need. We must understand that every part of our system prepares us for the next step. For students attending alternative schools, it may mean returning back to their home schools with the skills to succeed no matter where they go. I ask that we collectively see students not only as they are, but what they can be. I ask that we support every school in our system and provide students the right to learn and the opportunity to excel. This morning, the Baltimore County Student Council is headed up to Annapolis for Advocacy Day, where we had the opportunity to see government in action and were welcomed by Senator Brooks and Delegates Ebersole and Pasture as we watched the inner workings of the General Assembly. Baltimore County Student Councils met Governor Moore and Lieutenant Governor Miller as we extended civic education to the House and Senate galleries and around Annapolis. Next Thursday, students, vote for my successor and your next student member of the Board of Education. Our candidates are Nick Dimitriadis from Towson High School, Kayla Drummond from Parkville High School, and Nathan Harris from Carver Center for the Arts and Technology. I wish them all the best on March 23rd and look forward to seeing the results coming after. So be sure to check out candidate speeches and Q&A located on the BCPS website. So good luck candidates and I look forward to seeing the student voice in action. I'm keeping my report brief, but to end off tonight's report, I would like to share some good personal news. Um, I would like to share with you all that for the next four years, I will be attending the University of Maryland College Park studying philosophy, politics, and economics. I've also accepted an invitation to the Civicus Living Learning Program. I cannot thank the system enough for everything it's done for me, which is exactly why I pursued this position. My love for this system and our students is unconditional because I truly believe in the strength of our students and our growth together as a system. So thank you all. Let's get in good trouble. Congratulations on your decision, Ms. Hassan. You're now an official TERP. Okay. Um, the next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that I call Mr. Bersades. Good evening. Good evening. Earlier tonight, the board met in closed session and took action on the following cases, HE 23-02, HE 23-07 and case JCCP 5052, which was filed on July 28, 2020. Now would be an appropriate time to confirm the action taken on those matters. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on hearing examiner's case HE 23-02 and 2307 and authorize Ms. Gover to sign for those board members not physically present. So moved, Pumphrey. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Hassan. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jose? Abstain. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session with respect to JCCP 5052 filed on July 28, 2020? May I? So moved, Harvey. Thank you. May I have a second? Second, Hassan. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jose? Abstain. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? 
Yes. Ms. Lichter. Yes. Thank you. The next item on the agenda, oh, thank you, Mr. Mercedes. The next item on the agenda is contract awards, and for that I call on Ms. Joe's Chair of the Building and Contracts Committee. Thank you, Chair Lichter. Good evening, board members. The board's Building and Contract Committee met on Monday, March 13th. Items K1 through K24 have been approved by the committee and are being forwarded to the board for approval. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve items K1 through K24? No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Do I have a motion? So moved. I'll move, Dofferman. Thank you. Any discussion? Ms. Domanowski? Uh, yes, I had a question about um, one of the contracts. Um, it was GDA 31323, I think it was K. 19 building renovation and alteration services um hereford high school's historic barn has been waiting well, for look at here. is this where you put look this light is on look at this miss joe's your mic's still on no it's not it's i just unmuted it okay or dr savoy i'm sorry Ms. Uh, i wanted to know if uh, sorry so back to uh ida contract K-19 building renovation and alteration services. I wanted to know if any of these funds that were being um, set aside for the Hereford Barn historic repair that they've been waiting for. We're calling up Mr. Dixit, thank you. Thank you for your question. So the design work for historic barn is already complete. We were waiting for some additional grants money that we have received so pretty soon uh, if everything goes all right uh, it'll be awarded through using regular bidding process this contract is for small projects where we do not have time to bid that one we were we had planned and it has been bid now so what is the next step as far as i mean you said it's been bid on so now it's so it's uh, very soon you will see the contract <coughs> being awarded very soon okay Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Next, thank you. Oh, there's nobody there. <laughs> Next on the agenda. Wait a second. I gotta get. Okay. The next on the agenda is consideration of the Deer Park Middle Magnet School Capacity Relief Boundary Study Recommendation. And for that, I call on Dr. Yarbrough, Dr. Zarchin, and Mr. Dixit. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Dr. Williams, members of the board. Thank you this evening for the opportunity to share information with you and a recommendation regarding the Deer Park Middle Magnet School Boundary Study. With me, I have Dr. Zarchin, Chief of Schools, Mr. Dixit, Executive Director for Facilities. I'll turn it over to Dr. Zarchin at this time. So if I may make an opening statement, we are here to reintroduce for board approval the recommendation of the Deer Park Middle Magnet School Boundary Study Committee. The purpose of this study was to provide capacity relief at Deer Park Middle Magnet School. The superintendent initiated the boundary study in April 2022 for five middle schools in the region. The boundary study process was facilitated by an independent consultant Cropper GIS, and the process was managed by the Office of Strategic Planning. We had shared the results of that in our presentation before, and you have heard some of the community members 
uh, talking positive about it. So with that, I'll ask Dr. Zarkin to rec make the recommendation. Thank you. On February 14th, 2023, the Board of Education received for consideration a report from the Deer Park Magnet School Boundary Study Committee. The recommended boundary changes affect four middle schools. The recommendation known as Option D affects the boundaries of Deer Park, Franklin, Northwest Academy, and Pikesville Middle Schools. A board hearing was held on the recommended boundary changes on March 1st, 2023. Feedback was received from one individual. Communications regarding the process were extensive in multiple languages and made through the BCPS website, media advisories, emails, and correspondence from principals. The recommended option was voted on by the committee who engaged in a process of data collection, analysis, and community engagement. Engagement with the public was facilitated through a comp completion of a survey, the availability of a dedicated boundary study comment form, a public information se session, and a board hearing. All meetings were live streamed and available for viewing throughout the process in several languages. Throughout the months of the study, the committee attended five meetings that were reviewed by hundreds of documents, developed and evaluated options, and worked together to build a consensus. We thank them for their time and their commitment to the process. This concludes our reintroduction of this submission and request the board vote to approve the Deer Park Middle Magnet School Boundary Study recommendation of option D. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the Deer Park Middle Magnet School Capacity Relief Boundary as presented as option D in Exhibit L1. So moved, Hassan. Thank you. Do I have a second? Whoops. Nope. Whoops. Okay, I rescind my. I need another motion. Another person to make the motion. Oh, not okay. May I have another person make the motion to approve the Deer Park Middle Magnet School Capacity Relief Boundary as presented in Option D? Savoy second. Dr. Savoy, you'll be first. Do I have a second? <laughs> Mr. McMillian, thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. The next item on the agenda, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. The next item on the agenda is the report on the Maryland Comprehensive Assessment Program MCAP results report. And for that, I call on Dr. McComas, Dr. Zarchin, Dr. Gregory, and Mr. Barnett. Good evening, Mr. Barnett. And this is the awkward dinner table thing. <laughs> so I'll get started while we are. Thank you. I just oh, need a moment before I came to the table and went fast. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Thank you. And Dr. Gregory, are you? I'm sorry, I forgot to call Dr. Gregory. It's like family, the Thanksgiving dinner, you know, getting everyone at the table. So, um, yes, welcome. 
thank you again and good evening. So. Um, Good evening, Dr. Wims, Chair Elector, and members of the board. I'm Dr. McComas, and I'm the Chief Academic Officer, and I'm here this evening joined by uh, Dr. Zarchin, our Chief of Schools, Dr. Gregory, our Executive Director, and of course, one of our proud principals, Mr. Barnett of West Towson Elementary. And we're here this evening to bring forward an update on our Maryland Comprehensive Assessment up, um, scores from last year, uh, the 2022 administration, which would cover the 2021-2022 school year. Next slide, please. As always, we anchor all of our work um, in our strategic plan, the COMPASS, um, and our MCAP scores are a critical point uh, along our COMPASS connection. These are statewide assessments, which inc include a variety of assessments designed to measure our student growth and achievement across different grades and content areas, uh, as well as English language progress and proficiency. Our BCPS pathway for college and career success includes these MCAC metrics for kindergarten readiness, as well as ELA math across all schools and grade levels. MCAP assessments are critical um, in our monitoring of student progress. Next slide, please. Overall, this evening's presentation, we will focus on these 2022 results, uh, the implications for high quality teaching and learning, our long-term initiatives related to curriculum and instruction, as well as our short-term term continuous improvement priorities. And we will highlight along the way the improvement work happening in our schools uh, that support our key initiative focus area one of learning accountability and results. Next slide, please. So what exactly are MCAP? Um, what is the MCAP, or Maryland Comprehensive Assessment Program? It is a new set of assessments that are uh, given on after the pandemic compared to the assessments that the state gave prior to the pandemic. The previous assessments we often refer to as PARC, and that's, that was an acronym for the Partnership for Assessment of Readiness for College and Careers. So while all of us were working through the day-to-day uh, interruptions of the pandemic. The state too was working through some changes and they were uh, developing these new MCAP assessments just to give you a sense of what instruments were used prior to the pandemic, what was happening during the pandemic in terms of these assessments, they were under development. And then last year was the first year that we gave these new assessments. Uh, now they do measure the same standards but they are different instruments and uh, just so that everyone has a working understanding of that. Uh, these assessments are comprehensive, as the, the term MCAP implies, um, and they do involve kindergarten readiness, ELA and math for students in grades three to eight, um, as well as Algebra one, Geometry, and Algebra two, and of course our English 10 assessment. It does also include um, science assessments for students in grades five and eight, and in high school life sciences, or what many of us think of as biology. Uh, in Social studies, they measure uh, grade eight and high school government. And then they also, as we indicated, uh, monitor English learner proficiency by using the access for English learners uh, for students in grades K to 12. Um, and for um, our students receiving special services um, who are certificate bound, we use the dynamic learning maps or DLM for their math. Um, and ELA uh, standards. So if um, just to give you a sense of what's involved with MCAP, this evening we will focus, of course, on math and literacy. Next slide, please. Some of the important structural differences between PARC and MCAP is what we're gonna talk about now because that development that happened during those years of the, the pandemic, um, there is a significant different frame um, in for these new MCAP compared to the previous PARC. And what I mean by that is um, um, MCAP assessments, um, excuse me, um, you can see on the screen before you that there's four categories. The PARC assessments had five. Uh, there's also different scale um, scores and cut scores for those different categories. So when you think about going from five categories to four categories and then determining what actually is the cut score for each of those categories is different between those two instruments. Again, just to give you a sense of the architectural difference of these two instruments. 
you can see on the screen before you that uh, the new assessments, there's beginner, developer, developing learner, proficient, and distinguished learner is the categories that we will be using this evening and moving forward with state testing. Next slide, please. The MCAP, ELA, and math assessments have fixed scale score cut points. Um, as you can see on the screen before you, we see beginner learners have to score uh, between 650 and 724, developing learners, of course, 725 to 749, and proficient or distinguished learners score 750 up to 850. 750 is considered the proficient line um, uh, for students in these assessments. Uh, it's important as we move forward that we dig in and see exactly how close to 750 students are that did not make 750 or better so that we have a sense of how close to proficient they are and, and that impacts some of their short-term um, responses. Next slide, please. On the screen before you, you can see the data are reported by percent proficient and mean scale score. The data shown represent the mean score of students by grade level for the MCAP literacy assessment. And the blue um, horizontal line represents that cut score of 750 I just talked about. Um, and that is the line where we consider students to be proficient or higher, uh, labeled distinguished. As shown, the mean score for our elementary students is within two to six points of proficiency, while the mean score of our middle school students is within seven to 10 points of proficiency. Our grade 10 students' mean score was within two points of the proficiency mark. A closer examination of this data reveals that we had 5,458 students score within five points of 750. Uh, so while we know that we need to get them over the 750 line, um, we also have to recognize that we had that number that are close that we need to um, focus on. Uh, additionally, um, that 5,458 students who were within five points of the proficiency line, that represents 20.7% of our students. Um, the other thing I want to highlight on this screen is if you look closely at grade three, our students in this cohort of grade three students, so they were in third grade last year, they're this year's fourth graders. These are the students that have had the longest exposure to our open court foundational literacy curriculum, which is an evidence-based uh, curriculum anchored to the science of reading. And so I just want to point out that while certainly we want all of our students to be above 750 and distinguish, we can see here the beginning evidence that those newly implemented resources are beginning to yield stronger performance for our students. Uh, and that's just the foundational phonics piece uh, that doesn't get into the comprehension, which we'll be talking about later. Um, in upcoming um, opportunities and curriculum committee. Next slide, please. Here we're looking at, our again, our math uh, data from last school year. Um, and the data, um, the same data are displayed here for math uh, by grade level and content area. Of course, our blue line represents the 750 proficiency line. As shown, the mean score for our elementary students is within 10 to 13 points of the proficiency line, while the mean score of our middle or high school students are within 20 to 35 per, um, points of proficiency. When we do that closer examination of the data, what we see is about 3,044 students scored within five points of 750. Um, or that was 12.9% of our students that tested in math were that close to the proficiency line. Again, we recognize that we need to get them um, to, not just to 750 but beyond, um, but we wanted to tease that out to really understand how close are we. Another point I, I ask to draw your attention to here is if you look at the data for grades three, four, and five, these are our cohorts of students who have had um, opportunity with the new uh, Bridges Math Program, which is again an evidence-based uh, curriculum that we began implementing during the pandemic years. Um, and what we see here is students in grade three actually had full three years um, of Bridges. Uh, now, of course, those years encompassed the 20, uh, 20 to 2021, the 21-22 school year, so we recognize that there was great um, turbulence in as we were moving back to in-person instruction. But I just point out that we're seeing in that elementary some 
early evidence that those implemented um, evidence-based curriculums are yielding a difference. I also want to take a moment to point out that the, the grades six through um, eight data uh, represents our old curriculum. That does not represent the new evidence-based curriculum that we just began implementing system-wide this year. Next slide, please. The MCAP Algebra 1 and Geometry uh, were given in both our middle and high schools based upon student course participation, so for those students who are enrolled in those respective courses. High school students who had not previously met the state requirement for participation in a math assessment during high school were also included in the MCAP testing. The figures shown display that the MCAP mean scores for our students who participated in Algebra 1 and Geometry. Um, assessments with the blue horizontal line, of course, representing our 750 cut score, um, which concerns our students at the proficient or distinguished line. Students in advanced academic pathways for math in grade six scored proficient and close to distinguished for algebra one, while our students in grade seven scored at an upper level of proficiency for geometry. Our students in advanced academic pathways for grade seven had a mean score within 10 percentage points of proficiency for algebra one, while students in grade eight had mean scores within 19 percentage points proficient for algebra one and within 12 percentage points for geometry. Our high school student mean scores decreased in comparison at performance levels of close to developing or beginning performance levels for algebra. And for geometry, students in grade nine performed at developing or close to beginning level, while our students in grade 10 performed at a beginning performance level. Next slide, please. So what are we doing in response to this data? Because we all agree that our data needs to be much stronger than what we see here. Um, and so we are taking both short-term and long-term steps. And some of the things that we are doing uh, this school year as immediate responses to this data, um, as shared in January 23rd in a, a Team VCPS community update, uh, we are reevaluating our pacing guides uh, to ensure that we are focusing on uh, key standards. We're providing tailored support by school with pacing and professional learning to our staff to create short-term action plans based on identified student needs at the school level. We're offering targeted tutoring support for students in need of additional practice. We're identifying students who need structured summer support and um, it, reaching out to families to get those students engaged and enrolled in our summer opportunities. Reviewing our ELA and math curriculum guides and district assessments as well as convening as stakeholder groups for feedback to ensure that we're being responsive in real time to both the um, older curriculums that we're in the process of, of working through, but also our new curriculums that we are implementing. Next slide, please. Some of the long-term strategies that you have heard us talk about at different points and you will hear us continue to talk about as we move forward uh, through the school year. Conducting instructional rounds at the building level where we are going in and, and looking very closely at the quality and rigor of classroom instruction to identify what are targeted uh, responses that we need to do in terms of professional learning for our professionals. Implementing evidence-based curriculums that are anchored in the science of reading, um, such as our open court found um, foundational curriculum for phonics, um, as well as, you know, we are currently piloting two possible products to be considered for the comprehension and writing elementary curriculums. We are actively using DIBLES, which is a, a screener for early literacy. DIBLES stands for Dynamic Indicators of Basic Early Literacy Skills. And our DIBLES data is very um, strong in terms of the effectiveness of open court at those early grades. They're the grades that are measured really before third grade. So they're the foundations that lead into that third grade data that we were looking at a few slides back. Um, and we're providing acceleration resources for each unit, including diagnostic tasks, differentiated resources that address prerequisite skills and gaps, and scaffolding uh, resources to support students, as well as implementing a multi-tiered system of supports uh, of evidence-based uh, programs for literacy. Next slide, please. 
In terms of what we are doing to respond to math, uh, conducting instructional rounds, again, it's the same methodology by which we can go in and look at any subject area, but naturally we're focusing on literacy and mathematics. We have moved to implement our highly rated evidence-based curriculums in Bridges. This is really the third year uh, at elementary for the cohorts of students who had it in the first year of rollout. As you know, we do multi-year rollouts. Um, and then illustrative math is our new secondary curriculum that's just being implemented system-wide for the first time this year. This is where a lot of our active um, feedback from our teachers and, and our department chairs are supporting us in this implementation. Again, using diagnostic assessments that are built in to quickly identify what are prerequisite skills that students have previously mastered or have gaps in so that we can target that in small group instruction in the classroom. Uh, we have revised our frameworks for math assistance courses, whereby um, we have reevaluate how we identify students that need that assistance. Um, and then we are redesigning a summer math program, uh, piloting a push-pull pace model um, to support uh, our math students over the summer so they're building momentum as opposed to losing momentum. Next slide, please. And at this point, I will um, hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Zarchin. Thank you. With a focus on learning, accountability, and results, staff from the Department of Schools aim to provide timely, strategic supports to school administrators and staff that are data-driven and grounded in research. Our purpose is to increase access, opportunities, and achievement for every student in Baltimore County Public Schools. Staff from the Department of Schools serve to develop optimum capacity of principals in their effort to lead instruction for all students, ensure a positive, safe, and productive school climate, demonstrate and carry out equitable practices, and support and practice social and emotional learning. Specific supports to schools that have been operationalized during the 2022-2023 school year through the Department of Schools include the implementation of the elements of, infect of effective instruction, instructional rounds, monitoring the fidelity of implementation of the open court and bridges curriculums, use of the evidence-based strategies from the framework for teaching and learning, professional development relative to the creation of the master schedule, data literacy, social emotional learning, and equity in action. Additionally, coaching opportunities to analyze data with an emphasis on student groups to ensure learning is accessible to all students has been a focus. And now I will turn it over to the proud principal of West Towson Elementary School, Principal Jason Barnett. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity. So I want to just talk a little bit about what this looks like in the schoolhouse, but before I do so, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about my school, our school, sorry. West Towson Elementary School opened its doors in 2010, and when the school opened, the community was presented with a school that looked and felt a little different than other schools in the district. The design of our building was driven by a focus on environmental st sustainability, which is commonplace now for all schools in Baltimore County, and also our location as we share a campus with the Ridge Ruxton School. Um, sharing the campus with the Ridge Ruxton School has presented us with a lot of amazing opportunities to partner with the students and staff at Ridge Ruxton for a variety of activities throughout the school year and it becomes um, really one of the favorites for all of our students and staff as we visit Ridge and, and partner with them in a lot of these activities. It's a learning experience for both. Um, so our school, West Towson, is capped with an amazing green roof offering students with a unique outdoor learning space and um, a lot of inviting communal areas that provide students and staff members with a variety of instructional environments. Our school services students from several communities, including West Towson, parts of Rogers Forge, and homes along the Falls Road corridor. We serve students in kindergarten through grade five, and West Towson is a Maryland Green School, and our students have worked with their teachers to, to design and implement projects and programs to extend their knowledge of environmental science and outdoor education. Our families applaud West Towson for the quality of education and opportunities to become involved in the school and our staff members' genuine concern for each child. We love our Westies, for sure. Um, so our data and our MCAP scores. So for us, um, each school across the system, including West Towson, completes a needs assessment as a part of the development and the revision of the school progress plan. And the MCAP is a very important data point as a part of that development of our plan. 
As a part of this assessment, our schools will examine data through an equity lens, some of which include attendance, behavioral assessment data, social emotional, and of course, our very important stakeho stakeholder survey data. School progress planning involves stakeholders from across our school community, and from this planning, the school develops key actions and, and a professional development plan that they feel will best meet the needs of their students and staff. After developing our school progress plan, schools be begin implementing our action steps and the professional development plan in support of our staff. Schools will implement professional learning and participate in grade level, content, and other data-informed meetings. So for example, at West Towson, uh, we hold monthly meetings that we call CIA is the abbreviation, but they stand for curriculum, instruction, and assessment meetings. Um, these meetings provide an opportunity for us to share professional development with staff analyze our assessment data, and plan high quality instruction aligned to the Maryland State Standards. Um, in addition, as part of the administration, we conduct formal and informal observations of our teachers to monitor the implementation of the curriculum. Um, and the purpose of all of this is to design high quality lessons for students. Our teachers apply what they know about students' levels of motivation, learning strengths and needs, background knowledge, and interests to provide appropriate challenges for each student. This knowledge of each learner flows into and planning for small group instruction. And throughout the school year, every school, including West Towson, we analyze our progress and effectiveness of our school progress plan to determine next steps. Next slide. Oh, sorry. Back one slide. Sorry about that. Um, at the schoolhouse, we, oh, sorry. Next slide. Or, sorry. Um, assessment in the schoolhouse. Um, Throughout the year, we give a variety of assessments in the school, some of which have already been mentioned by Dr. McComas and Dr. Zarchin. Um, uh, the kindergarten ready readiness assessment that you heard about, abbreviated KRA, um, is given to all kindergarten students, and it's an assessment that allows our teachers to measure each child's school readiness. Dibbles, which Dr. McComas uh, perfectly described, um, helps our teachers and schools discern how students are performing on important reading skills. And so this is a fantastic opportunity for us as we examine the effectiveness of open court for us to look at assessment data that is a direct result of that um, high quality phonics instruction. Mm -hmm. So um, we also examine unit assessments which are given at the end of each unit of, unit of instruction and helps us to measure uh, the progress and acquisition of skills at the end of a unit of study and extremely important. Um, we also give MAP. Um, it's the measures of academic progress, an adaptive assessment that measures each child's knowledge of reading and math, and this assessment is given multiple times each year to students in kindergarten through grade five. Um, MCAP, which you heard about a little bit earlier, and then um, right now, our fifth graders are taking MISA, which is the Maryland Integrated Science Assessment, and it's administered to all fifth graders at the elementary level, and this assessment includes core ideas from life science, physical science, as well as earth, earth and space science. It provides information to educators, families, and the public on student progress towards proficiency on the Maryland Next Generation Science Standards. As a school, we use data from these assessments along with daily formal and informal teacher observations, which are very critical to move our students to potential. As a school leader, I am grateful for the support of my executive director, Dr. Gregory. Um, Dr. Gregory, Mr. Bender, our ele elementary executive directors um, in the central area, and all of our executive directors are strong advocates for principals and partners in the work that we do supporting students, staff, families, and our communities each day. So I am grateful for you, Dr. Gregory. Thank you. All right, Dr. Zarch. Thank you. Yep. To reiterate on Principal Barnett's thoughts, schools examine multiple data points. Uh, or assessment measures to determine the individual student's progress. Additionally, through analyzing multiple data measures, teachers are provided detailed, actionable data to move student performance. Each student is based on their learning path, and the teachers meet the students where they are and move from there. The data is really critical to that work. Moreover, assessment data provides teachers with the insight into students' acquisition of specific skills, concepts, and learning standards to determine necessary support, supports for re remediation and enrichment opportunities. In a typical school year, key data points such as student work samples, progress monitoring checkpoints, unit assessments, along with other data measures are provided. It should be noted that state manda mandated assessments such as the Maryland Comprehensive Assessment Program is only one of several measures uh, that help monitor students and move students to their potential in school. At this point, as we 
transition to the next slide, I would like to welcome Dr. Sharonda Gregory. Good evening. Next slide, please. In alignment with the COMPASS, our pathway to excellence, our goal is to increase achievement for all students while preparing a variety of pathways to develop students for career and college in a safe, orderly, and caring environment. With equity at the center, we strive to increase access, opportunity, and achievement for all students. Core values for students, staff, and families focus on student learning, effective teaching, effective leadership, high expectations, appropriate supports, positive and productive relationships, and meaningful communication and engagement. We value our students, staff, and families as partners in raising the bar, closing the gap, and preparing for our future. To that end, we encourage parents to review the individual student report to obtain the level of proficiency your child att obtained, attained on the Maryland Comprehensive Assessment Program, or MCAT. Keeping the lines of communication open through the Focus Parent Portal is also encouraged, as it is designed to enhance communication and involvement for all, I'm sorry, for communication for you and your child's education. Parent-teacher conferences are also encouraged to review your child's progress, including strengths and areas of improvement. In addition, BCPS Parent University is available on our BCPS website and offers resources, videos, workshops, and system updates to support the needs of families. Thank you very much. As we've shared before, the uh, academic achievement report are displayed for your understanding and we're going to turn it over to you for questions. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you very much for that presentation and thank you, Mr. Barnett, for joining the group to talk about West House. And I had the pleasure of visiting there a couple weeks ago to see a lot of what you said in action. So um, thank you. Questions from board members? Ms. Harvey? Thank you, everyone, for that information. I just have some uh, clarifying questions. For the Dibbles um, assessment, yes. when students K through three uh, indicate by their assessment that they are at risk for failing in reading, how are parents engaged uh, in that process? How are they notified? And, and what happens with parents and their students once that assessment is made? So I will tag our principal in because he can speak to uh, his school as a direct example. But the Dibbles data is important to understand that that is like real time data. And so it's, it's you know, we know data is best when you can get it in real time and get a response. So that's where it really boils down to our teachers being in good communication with parents um, around their students. Um, performance on a short cycle, right? One of our challenges with state data is it's a long cycle data, right? The Dibbles gives us that opportunity to kind of move into action very quickly. Uh, I'll ask our principal to kind of bring that to life, what that looks like at the school every day. So for us, um, you know, after that initial, the fall benchmark, so parents are notified in writing, and then the timing is fairly close to that fall conference day. Mm -hmm. And so we are able to share that parent report personally with families, um, either virtually or in person, whatever you know best meets their needs, and talk about what each of those data points means and then what that is going to look like in response in the classroom for their individual child. So um, it is wonderful in the fact that it's very personalized and provides parents that opportunity to kind of take a snapshot look at where their child is. Um, but just remember, we're not staying there. Our goal is growth, and um, it's often a very positive and productive conversation. Is is that process standardized across schools? Is that the expectation at every school that they will, parents will be notified and then that that will be part of their conference in the fall? Yes, and I don't know if, if Dr. Gregory or Ms. Shea uh, is, would like to add comment. Go ahead. Yeah, it's standard. Um, you have to speak into uh, the microphone for sorry. the record. 
Good evening. Um, yes, that is standard. The reading specialists from every elementary school are trained each year on the Ready to Read Act reporting requirements, which include the DIBBLE screening measures as well as the reporting structures and sample letters and templates. Um, as far as the conference, we um, strongly encourage schools to include that as part of the elementary conference, but um, even for parents who don't have the opportunity to schedule a conference, there is a requirement to report that data to parents. Thank you. Just to add to that reporting requirement, it's part of the Ready to Read Act. So, Other questions? Ms. Domanowski? No. I just had one quick question um, regarding the uh, grade 10 ELA MCAPs. Are you aware of any changes in that test from 2018-2019 um, school year to um, pre-pandemic, post-pandemic? Are you aware of any changes to that test? Go ahead. Hi. Yes, the entirety of the MCAP was redone um, through the pandemic. They changed the assessment and they changed the standard setting as well as the score point descriptors. So, what exactly? I mean, what changed? Did they take? A, I just. I mean, you're saying it changed. Everything changed, but like, yes. can you pinpoint a couple of things that? Um, um, the whole test changed. So, so they chose new passages. They had new items. They did um, a field test with the fall MCAP testing last year. Uh, they set new cut scores. They had new performance descriptors. And we have similar evidence um, statement analysis. So the reporting that we're actually working through with principals this week stayed the same. But the actual assessment changed completely. Uh, were there any writing portions that were changed? Like, were, were they still asked to write essays or? Yes. So there are. I'm sorry. Is it okay if I? Yeah, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize. Um, yes, they still have the same evidence-based selected response, and they also have constructed response items, like they have in the past. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Kuhn, did you have a question? I do. Thank you. Uh, Dr. McComas, you mentioned summer programs being made available to address learning loss. For students who are behind, sometimes multiple grades behind, will these summer programs be mandatory? So summer programs are not part of compulsory attendance requirements. So we do everything we can to engage parents in enrolling their students in summer programming uh, based on how a student is performing. There are instances by which that does not work for a family for whatever reason, and we certainly aren't um, penalizing the family that they may not be able to um, get the student to the summer program. They may have other arrangements that they have to, to make happen in the summertime. Uh, so when you asked if it's required, we do everything we can to have students participate in summer learning when they demonstrate the need for continued support. Uh, again, compulsory attendance laws do not uh, require summer uh, programming, um, but the majority of parents who are looking for support for their students are eager to enroll their students in summer learning. Thank you for You're that welcome. answer. Mm -hmm. um, I think you, you mentioned that grades three and four are grades that have had, they've had evidence-based open court um, for multiple years and we're still not hitting the proficiency for those kids. Is Where are we going wrong with this at this point? What, 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 what do you believe is happening? Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to kind of unpack that a little bit. So first, I just want to highlight that it's really students in grade three, if we're talking about literacy, English language arts, it's our students in grade three, you see they scored 748, so two points away from the proficiency. They're the students who have had two two full years. Am I saying that right, Mache? Is it three or two? It's the third graders had it in uh, second and third. So the third graders had open court in second grade and third grade. If you remember when we rolled out open court, our first year was only uh, K-1. And that was the 2019-2020 school year. Then during the 2021 school year, we rolled out um, two and three, grades two and three. And so think about all the things that were happening during that rollout. 
Um, and then, of course, last year we had, um, while it was better than the previous year in terms of the pandemic, we did last year face uh, significant impact um, in terms of the Delta variant and the Omicron variant during significant stretches of the year. So I, I say that, uh, Mr. Kuhn, not to make excuses, but I say that to be very real around um, when we're implementing these new uh, curriculum and we're giving teachers and students consistency of experience. Um, so I think that it's, you know, this has been a much more normalized year around attendance. We're not having huge disruptions because of, of um, the pandemic in the way that we've experienced it um, over the previous two years. Um, and so I think, quite frankly, the other thing to keep in mind, uh, along with the significant fluctuations that we've experienced as we've been trying to implement these, um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with implementation science, but we know that implementation science really indicates it takes three to five years to see sustainable change. In year three of a major initiative changing um, the way you do business, it's really in year three that you begin to see the quantitative evidence of that th that the change is taking hold. Uh, prior to that, a logic model really indicates change in behaviors, right? Change in classroom instructional behaviors, um, change in patterns and qualitative aspects, and then you begin to see the quantitative aspects in year three. And really by year five is when you start to see um, really what starts to become more sustaining um, levels of performance, and, and that's regardless of what the initiative is. Um, so when we look here at ELA and we see grade three students, there are students that have had the two years of open court. We know the students prior to that had even less, right? So students in grade four had maybe one year of open court, and students in grade five and uh, uh, beyond didn't have open court at all. So I think that that's part of it. When, again, when we look at math and bridges, uh, bridges started to roll out during the pandemic as well. So we, we, you know, the challenge was we were facing many hurdles. It wasn't a normal situation to roll out something new, um, but we persisted. And I think it's important to recognize we persisted against the odds. Um, and w we can see that where those things are in place, we are seeing more promising performance among our students. And certainly I agree, it needs to be stronger uh, yet still. Sorry, I get passionate, Mr. Kuhn. No, I, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm. I just want people to hear this and realize that, you know, um, the the change management, the implementation around yeah. open court, as you, as you said, is take is going to you know take up to five years, and you know kids don't have that kind of time, <laughs> you know, because that's that's going from first to fifth. Um, <clears throat> so it's concerning, and I'm wondering if we need higher higher fatality or more more intense training for teachers uh, at those levels to, to get them there quicker. I, you know, Mr. Kuhn, I invite all professional learning opportunity for our professionals. So thank you for thinking in that direction. I think, you know, the more support we provide our teachers, uh, the more support we ultimately provide our students. Um, and again, I think, you know, as we're moving past the disruption of the last couple of years, uh, and we're stabilizing our faculty because we know we had a great deal of turnover in our faculty as well. That professional learning is important in terms of our capacity. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Harvey, did you have another question? I did, thank you. Uh, one of the short term or immediate strategy steps that you list is offering targeted tutoring support for students in need of additional practice. Can you provide a little more detail on what that looks like in its implementation, how students are identified and engaged in receiving that uh, tutoring support, please? Sure, so I will, again, I'll kind of give the system um, stance towards that and the resources, and then I'll invite our principal to kind of describe what that, how that comes to life. So we do have um, grant funds to help pay for tutoring. Um, we rely on our classroom teachers and our school leaders to help identify in real time students who need that tutoring support and to organize those logistics. Um, and then we in the central team help support the funding uh, to, 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 to implement that, excuse me. So I'll turn it over and, and if you could share for us what that looks like in your school as an example. So 
At the school level for us, um, it, it starts with a comprehensive review of the data for individual students and then really trying to identify the, I guess what I would say would be the greatest needs for the students because um, we don't want to try to capture something too wide. We want to really focus with those individual students. So some of the data points that we talked about earlier are um, points that we review. So then we are communicating with families, obviously, inviting those students and then providing that you know, targeted support for those individual students or even small groups of students after school and or before school. And for us in particular, it's often um, built around the schedule of a, a parent um, or a student and what is most convenient for them. So, um, you know, we find a lot of times our elementary learners can be really fresh, like in the early part of the day. So if that's when that student is really at their best and most engaged, we will, you know, bring them in at that time and, you know, engage them with the teacher at that moment. And, um, you know, it can be very hands-on, you know, for students, depending on if that is their, their learning style and what's, what best meets their needs or, um, you know, it's a variety of strategies. Our reading specialists are engaged in that. Um, you know, the schools with math resource teachers or even our strongest math teachers are often the ones that are engaged in the planning and also the implementation of the tutoring. Does that answer your question? It does. Okay. I'm just uh, also wondering for those that I'm hearing you correctly, that for those students who are identified as needing additional and targeted support, that they are engaged by the school there's nothing active that parents need to do to engage those services. Those students are identified and then those services are offered to those students. Okay. So yes, but also I would say, you know, we love our parents as partners. You Absolutely. Know what I mean? So like, I mean, I can probably tell you I have 10 to 20 conversations a week with parents about their students and where they are and, and what they need. So we invite parents to certainly communicate because there might be something that they're seeing uh, from the learning side that's coming home, that their student is talking to them that we might not be exactly seeing in the classroom. And so that parent partnership is for us in particular, it's very critical. And I think probably all schools would say the same thing. So absolutely, like the feedback is really critical so we can identify students um, because as humans, we're not perfect, and sometimes we might miss something, but we hit the mark a lot, which is great. Um, but yeah, absolutely. So please, you know, parents reach out. Yeah. Absolutely, thank yeah. you very much. Um, I have a couple of questions. One is um, on one of the slides, you talk about the pilot program, the two ELA elementary pilots. Where um, are we on the timeline for deciding about the pilots or? Yes, yeah, so we are. Uh, we did move to implement the second pilot uh, in this just this quarter. Um, we will be in the curriculum committee, um, bringing forward an update on uh, where things are. Uh, with that, we wanted to make sure that this second product that we had um, enough time implementing the second um, pilot to have a, a good sense of comparison uh, between how both products work. Um, and so we're really looking at bringing something forward to curriculum committee in April. I know we have our curriculum committee next week and we'll be talking about the science of reading to help uh, begin to kind of anchor that conversation around where do those um, evidence-based curriculums fit into that. And Ms. Shea, I don't know if there's anything you wanna add. Um, just that Mr. Barnett happens to be piloting one of the <laughs> curricula, so we can um, also include him. But that timeline is, uh, that is absolutely the hope we have coming up. Uh, School-based visits for both pilots, both a return to the MyView Literacy Schools as well as to the schools piloting HMH. Um, we do have some schools doing both, so they will be really good partners in helping us to see the comparison and have some teachers that will have experience in both. Um, we're also collecting work samples so that we'll be able to bring as part of that conversation a difference in the expectation. And this goes back to Mr. Kuhn's question. While Open Court is a part of it, MCAP ELA in third grade also measures vocabulary, <laughs> fluency, comprehension, and those written responses. So. Um, that timeline is going to help us with that piece, too. And I probably should know this, but when, according to MSDE, are we supposed to have a, a scientifically-based program in use? <laughs> so the, the COMAR does not give a hard deadline because they provided enough leeway for s every school system has to work through its own Pro, you know, identification, procurement process, and budget process. Um, and so Comar did not lay in a hard deadline. Uh, the, the regulation came out in 2020, um, and the intention is to move school systems 
um, in, uh, I guess, with uh, swiftness and intentionality to an evidence-based curriculum, but they did not give us a hard deadline. Um, do, you can add if you have, if you know. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, I will say though, as um, some of the board members will recall, our Maryland Leeds grant funding was dependent on us putting forward the funding for letters and OG training, um, based on what Mr. Kuhn also mentioned around professional learning. But that, in our plan for the Maryland Leeds grant funding around the science of reading, we had identified our timeline that we were moving forward last year with implementing a program of evidence-based curriculum. Uh, we are in the space that if we do not identify an evidence-based core curriculum, that funding for letters and OG training could be withheld because it was not, it was a part of that. So I just want to give that most recent update in terms of, as Dr. McComas shared, she's absolutely spot on in the state's expectations, but because BCF BCPS submitted a plan for the Maryland Leeds grant funding that said we were moving in the direction of fully implementing a new evidence-based core and that we identified the funding for letters and OG training. We are at risk of not having that funding if we do not move forward with choosing that evidence-based curriculum. Right. If, for those who were with us in uh, July last year, you'll recall that was brought into question at the time. At the time, we reached out to the Maryland State Department of Education, um, and we explained that we were, had um, permission to expand and extend the pilot of the science of reading product that we were using. They took that as good faith effort on our part, that we were continuing to make progress to try to uh, move towards uh, a decision around an evidence-based curriculum. So. So we're working to get the funds for the letters training and, okay. Um, the other question I have is, you talked about instructional rounds. Have they started yet or is that to be, are you seeing any patterns and trends as you do the rounds um, about what's taking place in the schools? Yes. Dr. Gregory is shaking so her excited. head. I'm okay, so go. excited to share. Yes. Okay. Um, we are seeing um, what's emerging is um, that we have to hold students accountable for the work. Um, we've seen in all of the classrooms that teachers are responding for students instead of allowing them to respond. So holding students accountable, um, teaching to the rigor of the standard, definitely, but um, that accountability piece. Thank you. Any other patterns or trends that are emerging? Well, let me, let me respond to some previous questions. I think the question was, what's the role, I think the question about the role of the parent, or is it just the school? And, and I don't want to put Principal Bar Barnett on the spot, but I want the public to know it is the role of the teacher administrator, the teacher, classroom teacher, the parent, and the student. We do have students who are advocates for themselves they will see something that they do not like, such as a result on the MCAP or the MAP or the assessments. The beauty is what's happening, Principal Barnett and all the other principals, they look at these data points and make some instructional decisions within the building. So they're gonna program, and keep in mind, these results come in the middle of the year. And we plan during the summer. So that means many cases our principals and administrative team have to um, kind of reprogram and think about, so what is this data point telling us? But I just want to emphasize that we do have students who are advocating for themselves as well as parents who are um, partners in this work and our classroom teachers are using the data to inform. And what's happening, you heard a little bit, there's some decisions that are happening within the classroom. When you talk about small group instruction, when you talk about creative programming, as Mr. Principal Barnett shared about the reading specialist, uh, as we're building our capacity, we're also looking at the mathematics as, as well. So I just want to emphasize it is that triad that's very important that we can't constantly push to make sure if, if there's an area that a parent might not be as involved, then yes, the school may step in and support that student. But we also have, I, I just want to emphasize, I've been to all schools, all of our schools, and I've watched even the youngest learners kind of advocate about what they are willing to learn and want to learn. Um, but the beauty about this data point is just one of many. Informed decisions are made, and then that articulation from one grade to the next. So if you think about K, pre-K to five, what can, it ha what can happen within that grade span? 
We've also looked at our articulation with those students leaving elementary and going to middle school. And Dr. Zarchin and Dr. Gregory, well not Dr. Gregory because she's not middle school, but Dr. Minas and Ms. Santos are looking at that articulation when students are leaving elementary and going to middle school. So there's a lot of work that's being done just to look at the data points, but to have some conversations. But I have to emphasize that triad is so important and it's really helping to inform what the school are doing at the local level in terms of creative programming, small group instruction, some flexible scheduling that will continue even past the summer. Like Dr. Bosworth McComas said, we can't mandate summer school, but we can kind of encourage, and if that doesn't happen, there's some things that we have to happen, that will happen that following year to fill in those gaps. So I just want to emphasize that this is a partnership for that individual students with everyone supporting. Uh, and again, our area to really focus on, it's really like we talked about the written, taught, and assessed curriculum. That's what you've heard today but also the magic that's happening at each principal level with their teachers to really discuss what they can do with these data points to improve some areas of, for our students. So just want to emphasize that. And the question was, what, what's going wrong? And Dr. Boswell McComas mentioned this, but if you keep in mind what our system and students across America had to deal with, there's a lot that I felt that our students had to deal with. And, um, to have this assessment is a data point, which is a flashlight, to inform us what we need to do. But there's been some great discussions at this level and our school level to figure out what more we can do to support our students. Because we still have to support our students who may have been trauma traumatized in one way or the other. So I just have to emphasize when you look at the data, there's a lot of stories behind that. And I think Principal Barnett said it. Um, sometimes the schools may not know what's happening um, once the student leaves the building. And so that partnership is important. But I also just want to elevate that our students are incredible students. They will advocate and ask questions when appropriate. We want to encourage more of that ROA that our students can be their own self-advocate. We know that's not for every student, and that's why they have, we have our student support teams to really look at who are the students who are not doing well? Who are the students not showing up every day? Having those conversations with the families to figure out what we can do to support them. So I just want to just to emphasize that piece. I don't want to gloss over that. This is hard work that we are doing because it means making some changes and filling in gaps of students that may have had gaps before the pandemic. So that's not an excuse. It's just the reality of what we're dealing with. But uh, Ms. Harvey, it is that partnership of the student, parent, and school. And, and when they're all are not there, we have to figure out what more we can do to try to help either the parent or the student. So I, I appreciate uh, that insight into the process. I want to emphasize that my interest really is that when we have services available to students, that we don't require students, parents, guardians to move through a lot of processes to access those services. And if we're committed to, if we've committed to providing targeted intervention in the form of tutoring to students who we know aren't performing well, then it would be in their best interest not to have to go through a process to access those services. Even while we're engaging parents in the process, my interest is is that parents don't have to fill out a form students don't have to make a request advocacy is great and it's still our responsibility to say we see you we see your issues and we're here to help so that that's just that, I agree. that is my absolutely. perspective on that absolutely and, and i think and if the, we have all of our principals here they can describe how how we have to cut through a lot of processes to make sure we're we are really uh, uh, touching those students who are not engaged to get them engaged. And if you recall, when we first went virtual, we used a lot of our funds to engage our community, engage our families, and open up the building for additional support. So they didn't have to go through a lot, a lot of steps. It is a partnership. It is a partnership. And so 
I, I will say again, our principals are working hard to tap those individuals that need the most support as well as those families and not to have a lot of, of, a lot of red tape or processes as you described. Ms. Jones, did you have a question? Thank you. Actually, Dr. Williams answered some of my questions. My concern was um, that many times we know that when parents are involved, students do well. What about those students that don't have parents or have parents that cannot be involved if they're first graders, second graders, third graders? Um, we've seen the results, and I think waiting for a state to impose a timeline, um, we need to do that, impose a timeline on ourselves. So I, I don't agree with constantly having partnership. I think we need to intervene for a, a kindergartner, first, second, third grader, if the parents are not involved, and do an early intervention uh, without all of the hoops that we have to jump through. Secondly, I think Ms. Shea talked about the Maryland Leeds grant that we may lose. How much money is that, the grant, or how much? So uh, give me a moment, Ms. Joe, to like recollect here. Um, so the Maryland Leeds grant was, I'm sorry, 1.5, thank you, colleagues. Uh, uh, 1.5 is what the Maryland Leeds grant was, and, um, and so that was what we had put in for, uh, we had applied for the full amount for the science of reading. Thank you. Ms. Jones, did you have any other questions? Um, no, not at the moment, thank you. Anyone else? Ms. Nowanowski? Um, for the, um, the pilots, when did you start um, you know, putting them in schools and, and starting, when did you start those? So, uh, it's, so the first pilot we began last year uh, in the last quarter of the school year. Uh, we had intentions to start third quarter, but Omicron, um, I think it was Omicron at that time, um, Push, we pushed it back out of um, re response to that. So fourth quarter last year for the My View pilot, and then that we had permission from the board in July to expand that. Uh, many of the schools that were implementing that product had asked to um, expand the number of teachers or grade levels um, in that. Um, and then, um, we, so we were inter implementing My View through the fall. Um, and then we had um, a request, you know, we had stakeholders who were interested in us um, considering products other than my view. So then we began to implement um, HMH, is it Into Reading, is the name of that product. And we just began that this uh, third, February 13th. Um, so you're still using both right now. Have you made a decision on either one of them? No, because we are we just have only been implementing the second product for just about four weeks now. Um, so we want to implement a little longer to see. I'm just concerned. Uh, do you are these implemented in a small group by grade, by school, by homeroom? how many how many students are being affected at a time? So we have um, thousands of children participating, hundreds of teachers in dozens of schools for both pilots. It's a significant size of data pool, if you will. Um, the reason that we, what we would be bringing forward in the timeline that Dr. McComas described um, is a recommendation based on the data from the two pilots. So what we would be bringing to the curriculum committee is a description with the evidence I described, teacher surveys, student work samples. Um, what we will not have for something like HMH, as we just talked about, um, I'm not gonna have different MCAP scores. I'm not gonna be able to point to that type of data because of the time frame. Um, but we will bring both quantitative and qualitative data within the scope of the pilot and then what will happen in that discussion is we'll bring forward that information to the board with our recommendation for the product that we would do system-wide moving forward and what made you decide the the my view and the HMH why did you narrow those two down so we follow po um, policy and rule 6002 when selecting any curricular instructional material
So over 18 months ago, we initiated the process. It starts with the request for information. We work with the Office of Purchasing, um, and they put out basically an all call to publishers. We identify the criteria of what we're looking for for this particular resource. We get publishers respond and send us materials, and then we have two levels of review. The first review is internal. Um, that includes staff from the Office of English Language Arts, ESOL, special education, as well as a smaller group of teachers and administrators the first review is just to see, did it meet our requirements? So for example, one of our requirements was that it had to include uh, a blend of print and digital resources because we had students in the virtual learning program. And so we had some that responded that didn't do that. So that's just an example of the initial criteria. Then we move all of the products that meet that initial criteria to a much larger stakeholder committee for review. That includes, again, representatives from, as outlined in policy and rule, um, we have parents, we have stakeholder groups, um, including uh, representatives from the GTCAC, Area Advisory Council, Special Education, as well as teachers, administrators, reading specialists, staff development teachers, and central office. From there, the top recommendation at the time was My View Literacy from Savas. And so that was, and it was a clear um, front runner from the data that we collected, which is why we chose that as the first product. When it was requested, after we had some feedback from stakeholders, uh, it is hard to change. It is hard to move to a new curricular uh, resource. It is a lot for teachers to learn something new, especially in light of everything else Dr. Williams just described that our schools have been going through. Um, and it is also a significant increase in the rigor of the standard. As Dr. Gregory described, um, these evidence-based resources are much more rigorous. And so when you combine that with students who may not have yet de demonstrated the proficiency, we were getting feedback that it was a challenge. And so in order to honor that feedback, feedback from stakeholders, we decided to add a second product. When going to choose the second product, we went back to that stakeholder review of the products reviewed and chose the next highest scoring product to move forward, which is where we landed with HMH into reading. We then provided training. We met with the Department of Schools to identify schools that would be reflective of the system at large so that we could have good data, whether that was schools that serve Title I populations, um, high percentage of multilingual learners, um, all different populations around our school. We also went back to our My View Literacy schools to ask if any of them had some teachers, especially those that had raised some concerns, if anyone wanted to switch or to try the second so we would have that point of comparison. We then provided training for all of the schools and teachers. It had to be voluntary. We did not want any teacher in the middle of the school year being required or voluntary told that they had to change because it is a significant lift. Do you want me to pause? Yes. <laughs> so okay. I, I will just say to the board, allow the curriculum committee to provide that timeline. There's a lot that has gone on over the 18 months, and I think Ms. Shea was doing a nice job of giving an overview, but there's a little bit more to kind of um, the peaks and valleys that we had to deal with over the past 18 months. So I think we can provide a, a kind of a timeline about um, my view and how we got to that point in the, the new curriculum that we're piloting now. The, um, I was kind of getting to my point of do we think we chose the right time to be piloting new programs in our school when we're going coming out of a pandemic and we're, we need three to five years for these curriculums to work and our children need help now? I would so say that. So yes, <laughs> yes, 18, I, I will respond on, on their behalf, yes. 18 months ago we were here trying to move forward a new curriculum because we saw, because we saw the need we desperately saw the need. We received feedback, and we were asked to extend the pilot as well as look at something else. So we did what we were asked to do. Um, and so we need to do the, the committee will be coming forward to the board to be making some recommendations in the near, in the near future. Okay, 18 months is a long time. Near future needs, I think, is right, oh, I'm, is I'm right now. I'm not disagreeing with you, absolutely. Again, we came to the board and said we need to do X, Y, and Z. 
we wanted to, we were directed to continue to pilot, continue, continue to explore. But that doesn't preclude what's happening in each classroom and what the teachers are doing, what the administrators are doing. But we do know that we have to make a decision about this particular curriculum based on the direction that we were given. So what the team will be coming for for saying board or committee, we'll start with the committee, here's the recommendation, and then from that point, we'll make a decision hopefully for the board. But we were given, we've had this conversation long conversations about a direction to go and it was because of the pan pandemic and coming out of the pandemic that there were some decisions made for us to extend the pilot to look at something else differently so I, I i understand your point but i wanted to give the context as to why we are where we are at this point but i think to provide a, a much more comprehensive overview of where we started and how we got to this point may be beneficial for the whole board. And probably not tonight, but at that curriculum committee or future board meeting would be helpful. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Pumphrey, do you have a question? I think you partially answered my question. You may have answered a or to cut off, so I'm not sure. Um, for the schools that are piloting both, um, when they were given the opportunity to switch from my view to the new pilot, um, were, was that also chosen teacher by teacher for each classroom, or did the whole school, the whole every every classroom that was piloting my view make the switch to the second pilot? It was teacher by teacher, um, and some principals met with their entire faculty, and then as a team, they said, "We're one family. We plan together. We want to all make this decision together." But. In some schools, it was two teachers decided to stay, one teacher chose. It was really important. Um, there's, there's no question, it's a lot of work. And it's, and it's a tremendous effort for teachers, and we wanted that feedback to reflect their um, energy and interest in doing that. So in a lot of cases, the principals brought it to the faculty, and teachers had a conversation as colleagues, because of course there is value in continuing to be able to plan together. Um, so in some cases, it was that, but the um, ask was, Teacher by teacher. Thank you. Sure. Um, on the math slide, it talks about piloting a push-pull pace model. Is that a commercial product? Is that a methodology? What is push-pull pace? Do you want to go first? No, to, oh. go um, it is not a product. It is a, a methodology approach and reflects three different ways to give real-time support to students. Um, and so what we asked schools to consider is rather than waiting for a student to fail an entire course and then go down the path of more traditional credit recovery or re-enrolling, to look at data at each marking period and either push students into using um, some of the APEX tutorials or um, self paced blended learning resources at the time to fill in those gaps, um, to pull students either in some of the in-school tutoring that we already discussed or into some creative scheduling spaces that Dr. Williams described, um, or the PACE model is how to take the assistance frameworks that the mathematics office has provided course by course and demonstrate for teachers how to pace within the curriculum at point of use opportunities for reteaching um, so that students have an opportunity to demonstrate new learning and mastery of standards within the course and not have to wait until they've failed the course. So okay. just to add to that, every principal was introduced to this instructional strategy during the principal's leadership development meeting meetings that happen every month. It, it, it went from them to their department chairs or math specialists to understand, to then implement, in a, that it is a strategy, not a curriculum off the shelf. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, panel, for your presentation and the discussion, and thank you. Um, the next item on the, First, Ms. Gober, do I still have a um, quorum? Yes, okay. The next item on the agenda is informational items, including the minutes of the January 9th Southeast Area Education Advisory Council meeting, and also an update on key school legislation. And at this, at this time, I call Ms. Hassan regarding key school legislation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Board members, I urgently bring to your attention House Bill 119. Um, House Bill 119 was originally regarding the local adoption of the state health curriculum, but has been amended to prevent any and all local autonomy regarding curriculum framework, standards, and instructional materials. Um, MAVE has already indicated their strong opposition of this bill. Um, as the chair of the Legislative and Governmental Relations Committee, I also ask 
ask for your strong um, opposition of this bill. And therefore, at this time, I move that the board agree to oppose House Bill 119, County Boards of Education, Curriculum Guides, and Courses of Study requirements, and to send a letter on behalf of the board regarding its position. So Ms. Hassan has made a motion. Is there a second? Second. second. Kaminowski. Mm. Thank you. Any discussion? Um, a roll call vote, Ms. Gover? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? She's Ms. Not. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Uh, Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. So the letter passes. Favor is eight. Okay, right. The Thank letter you. passes, and we will send that um, immediately because there's a sense of urgency around that. Thank you, Ms. Hassan. Of course. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is board member comments and agenda setting, which is an opportunity for board members to provide comments and topics for future board members. Um, is there anyone that has a comment or an agenda item? Mr. McMillian. Thank you. I'd like to see the Sussex Causeway uh, discussed and placed on agenda. In 1956, the Causeway originally was a footbridge over Duck Creek, allowing elementary school students to walk to Sussex Elementary from a neighboring community. Two property owners in 1956 gave a four-foot piece of property from each of their, their yards to the Board of Education as a legal easement for the property owners, they received $1 for this in 1956. Years later, the bridge was replaced with an approximate 400-foot asphalt walking trail. So for 67 years, this causeway has been opened, has been opened 24-7 as a thoroughfare between two neighboring communities over Duck Creek. The community members have expressed the view to to return the property to the current owners and close the causeway. I would like to bring this in front of the board and the public, and I'd like to discuss it, and I have a recommendation at that point. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Um, I'd like to add the Hampton Elementary School um, emergency boundary study to the agenda, as well as long-term solutions to these boundary studies, as they sh they really should only be in place for emergencies and we need to get ourselves to a place where we're not having an emergency every year because we've moved one um, overcrowded school to the next hour overcrowded school so i would like um, long-term solutions added to the boundary studies thank you other comments or agenda items just check in the chat is there anybody that put anything okay doesn't look like it um, okay. Thank you for those two agenda items. The last item on the agenda is announcements. The board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, March 28th, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. Thank you for joining us tonight. At 9 o'clock, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you.